be introducing the next uh, chairperson uh, for uh, the session, uh, which will look at the infusion of new technology in um, the work of the um, uh, in in land policy in in India. And uh, I have the privilege of introducing Malcolm Childress, who is executive director of the Global Land Alliance. Uh, and co-director of Prindex. Prindex is the Global Benchmarked Property Rights Index, uh, which uh, NCI is also hoping to work on in collaboration with the Global Land Alliance and the Overseas Development Institute. Malcolm uh, used to be at the World Bank as a senior land administration specialist, and uh, prior to that as a senior research scientist at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Um, he's had extensive uh, experience in this area, um, uh, land resource specialist for uh, 30 years or so now, uh, focusing particularly on rural property, property rights and strategies for managing critical global, global ecosystems. So welcome, Malcolm, and uh, thank you for agreeing to uh, moderate this panel discussion. We have a great set of panelists. Uh, you can introduce them briefly and then we'll get going. Thank you, Malcolm. Thank you, Shekhar. Uh, thank you, everybody, for joining. And uh, thanks to NCAR for hosting this meeting. And of course, it's a great uh, pleasure to be uh, collaborating and, and thinking um, deeply about the land administration, land governance, land management uh, challenges in India and how to respond to them. Um, very excited about our panel. I think we're the last discussion of the meeting and hopefully uh, we'll be able to, uh, to, to, to close with a lot of, um, a lot of valuable uh, learning and material. Um, I would just, um, say I think that we are living a, um, in a period of unprecedented technological change in the land governance space um, in which uh, the potentials of remote sensing um, and new things like drones, new things like artificial intelligence are really changing the um, the spectrum um, of what can be done um, almost by the month. And it's, um, it's in fact hard to, to keep up with the pace of the innovation. So we'll try to do that today. Um, at this point, there's over 700 Earth observing satellites, observing <laughs> different, uh, different spectrum. We are linked in the GPS grid down to the level of our cell phones, which can track where we are in real time. Uh, we have uh, now the ability with drones uh, to observe in detail almost any place on earth. Um, so our panel today will talk about uh, these things as well as um, some very interesting applications. We have four panelists and um, I would like to uh, give each panelist about uh, 15 minutes to present and then I hope we'll be able to take a question uh, period at the end. Um, our first panelist will go in order from the uh, program. Um, Alok Primnagar, the Joint Secretary from the Ministry of the uh, Panchayati Raj uh, for the Government of India. Um, Alok, I, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. I've been listening in to the previous conversation and I really got interested. So thanks for having me here. And uh, like you said, uh, the drone technology is something um, that we are all exposed to. And now we, we, the experience that we are gaining has been very heartening so far. And uh, as a result of it, the scheme that started with very meager initial allocations has now become the talking point and all that. So I'm going to confine my conversation, um, the my presentation, to the things that I have faced uh, in this scheme so far. Uh, there are very intelligent panelists here. In fact, uh, the speaker, I think, who's to follow uh, me, uh, Mr. Chokalingam, is among the most uh, knowledgeable people on the subject that I have met. 
the trigger for the scheme actually came from the state of Maharashtra where they started doing that and then they were looking to uh, plug the gaps in their funding. So that's how we stepped in. Uh, but now having worked with so many different states and you know, having looked at how people have improvised to carry it out. Uh, so that has been inspiring, a little intimidating because now the onus is on us and the Survey of India to provide solution. So the thing about the survey that is being done under the Swamitva scheme is that it is a first time survey of Abadi lands, which is the rural habitations, which are hitherto unsurveyed. So whereas you find that agricultural lands are surveyed all over the world because the issue of tax collection is involved, uh, not in the case of Abadis. So you call them Lal Dora, which means that there was a red line that was drawn that inside the red line, the government is not concerned with what you're doing. And so the developments there were uh, chaotic uh, and not amenable to uh, well-planned structure and planning and all that. So now the survey of these properties are being carried out for the first time. There are several advantages which everybody knows about. And so we've set about doing this using drones because uh, they are typically very intensely packed and uh, the drone gives us several advantages. One of which is that um, you're able to so, yeah, you're able to achieve so much in very little time and with very little cost inputs and the accuracies are huge. We can get up to five centimeter accuracy. So we are in Abadi lands and that is a distinct advantage. Uh, the place where I went and saw it is where uh, the property tax in the rural habitations is devolved onto the gram panchayats. And so the panchayats had a stake in uh, successful completion of these surveys in preemptive resolution of any conflicts that were arising when the lines were being marked on the ground. Lines uh, have to be marked on the ground inside the Abadi area. They're marked on the rooftops, on this, wherever the drone can see. And where it can't see, people have to go down at the end of the drone survey and check out uh, those lines and insert them also. So after that, uh, the parcels are identified. They have a one-one correspondence then uh, with the uh, the residents or the owners uh, of those properties, which is something that the revenue department does for them. And then there is the process of ground verification followed by uh, the uh, publication of the results in the public domain, uh, so that if there are any objections to be raised those are going to be raised. When we started this, we had the Maharashtra template, but then we also learned that Haryana has been doing it. And while Maharashtra were doing it under the land revenue code, uh, Haryana were doing it under the Panchayat Raj Act because the section 25 of the Panchayat Raj Act of Haryana uh, says that the Abadi lands are a responsibility of the local panchayats. So immediately there was this variety, you know, where there was a Sanad uh, a one page document that was being issued uh, by the government in Maharashtra. In the case of Haryana, we had a title deed, which was a six page document, which said pretty much the same things, uh, but then it was a different format. It was a different set of people uh, who were involved. And of course the survey of, uh, in Haryana was across land boundaries. So there was agricultural and non-agricultural land that was there. A component of this scheme is the CORS stations, which is the Continuous Operating Referencing System. Um, you are the expert, you know about it already. Uh, but uh, installing this system, Survey of India were already in the process of doing it. The project has given it some impetus. And uh, now by the end of the implementation of this project, there'd be a CORS network across the entire country and which is a huge advantage. Um, we are going to have the CORS station come in the first year of the main scheme itself, which would begin from the coming 1st of April. And once this thing is in place uh, to reference themselves at a certain location, it becomes a very easy job. They don't have to install, uh, take days, a couple of days to just have a ground control point. They can just stand 
on one of these CORS stations and in five or 10 minutes, they can have the accurate location of that place. So that is a, that is a huge common good, actually. People could use it across departments, across agencies uh, for the accurate location of, uh, of a certain point which is also the advantage of uh, this uh, uh, you know survey by drones that should you want to go back to that site to check you have uh, a time stamped evidence and very uh, clear geo coordinates so the person could go there and verify and nobody would contest that and you have the flexibility to revisit it any number of times the resources that we used so far uh, i have not done it myself, but from the figures that I got from the Department of Land Resources, the cost involved in the drone survey is a tenth of uh, the cost that it took to uh, have a unit of uh, land measured using the total station techniques. The time taken is way less. In fact, if uh, one has a cluster of villages, the drone just flies up uh, and it comes back to you in about 15, 20 minutes, having completely surveyed these uh, cluster of villages. Our target uh, was huge, is huge actually, against that we've not been able to achieve a lot, but then we were at a start and we had to get a lot of things lined up. The states had to come on board, they had to make adjustments to their land revenue codes to allow for this uh, title or this property paper, which was hitherto unknown, and they've done well to bring it on board. And once they, they came on board, the rest of it was just led by the people and the leaders because everybody saw value in what was being done uh, so much so that the scheme got launched on the 24th of april this year and uh, on the 11th of october the prime minister himself uh, chose to give away uh, the first batch of uh, property cards to nearly one lakh uh, property owners across about seven and a half hundred seven sixty three uh, villages across uh, the six states where we are currently working. And now it's got everybody started. There are requests from any number of states that we want to come on board and tell us what's to be done. And no issues if the money that you're going to give, uh, give us is not going to cover all costs. It would be mostly us, but you just bring the technology to us as quickly as you can. So things are looking good and, and, um, and the encouragement is huge for what we've been doing. Uh, part of the uh, confidence uh, that the scheme inspires come from the judicious mix of uh, activities on the ground and the technology intervention. Uh, initially, these lines have to be marked using limestone paper, uh, sorry, limestone powder on the ground. And some people have used paint, some have used reflective tape and, you know, uh, the innovation list is pretty huge. So, um, so that becomes your first step of diligence. Once these lines are being drawn, the people, they step out of their houses, they take a look at what's going on. Everybody is very keen not to, you know, not to have a wrong line drawn to their disadvantage. And so, and then there are people who don't talk and they, they go back home, they call up their friends and relatives and say that this is what's happening. And those people come and they, I don't know, try and stall the process, but the panchayat wants it to go on. So, so your, uh, your initial step is done. People are aware of it. They've asserted themselves or they've decided to assert themselves later. So in a way, this is also the, the, the first step, like an issue of notice or something. And uh, once this is done, uh, the Survey of India team do their back-end operations. They turn it into ortho-rectified images. And then they come back to the village for ground truthing where you make your corrections. So this is the second stage. You come back to the ground. And then um, in the case of Uttar Pradesh, they, in, they issue individual uh, notices to the various uh, landowners. And people can look at their own map and, you know, check with their elders and, you know, if they're good, they call up their relatives. If they're bad, they don't, and their neighbors do it for them. But anyhow, that is the next step, and people work it out, and they are now pretty much set in their mind that this is something that is inevitable. And then the technology thing takes over because there is this uh, drone flying in the air. There's, it's got no pilots, and so people are fairly confident that what's been done on the ground is going to stay uh, in the images that are being 
captured by the drone. So this judicious mix is something that's uh, that's very important, and so it inspires confidence. And yet, one one cannot blame it on the technology entirely, you know, because you you've been a part of it yourself in the tuna line marking on the ground. There is a tremendous amount of permissions that are needed. So that is part of the reason that we've not, not been able to be set ourselves a target of achieving nearly 14, 15,000 villages flying by this time. But we are still stuck at about 5,000, 6,000. Uh, the reason being that this is something that's happening for the first time. There is the uh, Ministry of Civil Aviation, Ministry of Defense, the Airport Authority of India, the Director General Civil Aviation, uh, so many people that I keep running into newer people and as a result of which I know a lot of people now. So, uh, so, but then things are shaping up and, uh, and they're looking better for the next batch of states who we are going to include from the next. Uh, another spin-off has been, uh, we started this with very meager resources, I told you. I think to begin with, Survey of India might have had only 45 to 50 drone teams for their entire operation. And now we have a single state of Uttar Pradesh where we've got to fly drones in 75,000 villages. Uh, even if one does five villages per drone team per day, it's a huge amount of work. And so they've had to uh, approach uh, private operators, people with those quality of drones with them, and they've engaged them through this. So, so it's led to you know, encouraging or uh, nurturing of an ecosystem. And one could now, uh, an entrepreneur could think of investing in buying a few drones, employing a couple of people, a pilot and a co-pilot in its operation. And, uh, you know, they'd have a livelihood for these uh, three years at least, in which time one hopes that more and more people would be uh, doing this. Uh, another thing that's extremely good about uh, the drone survey is that once the images have been created, and the uh, property cards have been given away, uh, there is going to be revisions, property boundaries, are either they're going to be split further, they'll change over a period of time. And for this updating, one does not need to fly the drones again, as I learned. Uh, one can just use a rover and uh, based on the annual frequency or whatever frequency has been determined by the state, the uh, maps and the images can be completely revised. So this was a spin-off benefit that I wanted to talk about what one needs to uh, in the uh, in the distribution that i spoke of on the 11th of october the prime minister also interacted with a few uh, benefici uh, with a few people who had got their property cards based on which they had been able to source loans so there was uh, this lady called ram Piyari, who's been a widow for many many years and she's raised children on her own she's a vegetable vendor and she proudly displayed the 20,000 rupee loan that she's been able to take based on which she's been able to buy a cart of her own. And uh, at the other end of the spectrum, we had a big uh, uh, or a bigger owner of land in Haryana who could source a loan of five lakh rupees, which that person was going to use in the construction in the addition of some buildings to their house because now they have a paper so they are being able to leverage this asset. So this is something that we need to do a little more work with. We are engaging with the, uh, with the Department of Financial Services uh, so that the, uh, the paper uh, can be given a greater degree of credit, credence and you know, based on uh, the, the legal framework that backs uh, the property card or Swamit Abhilek or Adhikar Abhilek. It goes by different names in different states yeah and the, the future management of this this has opened up so many different avenues for instance in haryana and they're also looking to reimagine a whole gram panchayat and now the property cards gives them a basis if they're going to have to relocate people from here to another place based on the geography based on road connectivity and several other considerations uh, they have a basis and they can tell this person that look i i moved you from here so this is that same parcel of land with or without benefits in a different location. And this was not something that was possible. And they tell us that they are going to have one such panchayat come up uh, from uh, based on the spatial planning principle. One also now can think of having uh, uh, a system of uh, 
maps being approved so that the development in villages can be less chaotic. I think I am pretty much at the end. A thing that we've not been able to really do so well is that uh, there are people who live outside Abadi areas. Even in Abadi areas, one finds that uh, the, the most privileged people have the pick of land. And there are others who are uh, who are out of favor or who occupy a lower rung on the social ladder. So, so these people would have marginalized lands. And there would be others yet who are outside uh, the Abadi lands. So uh, even with these, uh, there are some states who come forth, they've increased the Abadi lands to include some of these settlers. And in Madhya Pradesh, in Dindori, in parts of Harda, I think property cards, I know that property cards were also issued to some of the uh, people who were outside Abadi lands. I believe in, uh, in Karnataka, they are doing the same thing. And so that is a positive, but that is not something that we've been able to completely resolve. And we are learning. We is just not, uh, we is the ministry here and the states. We are learning as we are going and we are happy to share this with you. So that is uh, all that I have to say for now. Thank you very much. Back to you. Yes, thank you very much, um, Alak. And I think um, congratulations on the a tremendous uh, progress so far with this um, in multiple states. Um, I think it's quite notable uh, talking about a 10 times cheaper uh, factor um, in cost of survey. Um, I think also the, the kind of flexibility you've mentioned, the possibility to work at village level and um, talking about scaling now from five and 6,000 to to 75,000 villages um, is really quite remarkable and shows um, both the, um, the promise of the technology, but also the, the critical, as you pointed out, judicious mix of community engagement to prepare, literally prepare the ground, prepare the boundaries. We've certainly found in other um, jurisdictions around the world that that process of putting the boundary markings in can be a, a very important process for a community to clarify its own boundaries and work out um, work out uh, property clarification of ownership prior to the mapping. And then this, uh, this amazing ability to fly quickly and provide uh, orthorectified images uh, often within hours or days uh, to validate. So, um, I would actually like to um, then follow uh, with um, Commissioner uh, Chakalingam. I'm going to shift our order from the program because I think it will follow um, more now into some specific state experience from Maharashtra. Uh, Commissioner Chakalingam is the settlement commissioner uh, for the government of Maharashtra state. And um, Commissioner Chakalingam, we give you the floor. Thank you and uh, thanks, Mr. Malcolm. Thanks for giving an opportunity. Uh, uh, Mr. Uh, Nagar has covered the, the essence of drone survey and it is his leadership along with the secretary, MOPR, Ministry of Panchayat Raj and the perseverance and follow which is making this possible at the country level. We started at the state level, but the country level it is being pushed really by them and it is made possible even in Maharashtra with their constant follow. I am going to give a small presentation which essentially put it in a pictorial way uh, what uh, Mr. Alok told. I'll just give me a second, I'll share my screen. Hope this is uh, visible. Yes, yes. It is now. yes, this is visible. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. So uh, let me give a small uh, idea about what we are talking about. The legal basis for this drone survey is that it is the clean slate survey compared to the agricultural land where the survey is already done. And 
a clean slate survey is always based on the factum of possession means whoever is the possessor has been given the right of converting their possession into a holdership this comes from section 27 of the limitation act which reads as shown there at the determination of the period hereby limited to any person for insuring a suit for possession of any property his right to such property is extinguished it is not just a remedy it is a right is extinguished this is what the law says and the article 112 gives the period the period after which the possession is no longer particular person not only possession but the right also is 30 years for government land this is where we are flowing from this is not in the negative sense of the term uh, as far as the abadi lands are concerned this is not necessary that they are government land it is technically in a higher legal sense of the term it is government land but it is meant for people to occupy it the process is only converting them and giving it to the uh, people whoever is in possession peaceful possession as uh, explained already the continuously operating reference stations is a by product of this entire uh, survey Uh, as far as maharashtra is concerned nearly 50% of the stations are established and the systems are installed we are expecting by december 15 the entire system will be operational and uh, most of you will be knowing on the left side is the station on the right side is the rover using the rover when the core system is operational we can measure with better than a centimeter level accuracy in millimeter level accuracy within a minute in a normal system without course it would have taken longer time this is one precondition before we go faster as uh, nagar sir explained why we were we are uh, not going very fast one of the reason is that our core system is still to come in place this is highly needed for two three things about which i will come little later the second most important thing is that creating awareness among the people this is the place where we did the pilot the gram sabha the entire village come together to listen to what we are, what we intend to do unfortunately the corona created a situation where this coming together is little difficult but with uh, segregating the groups and keeping social distancing this is being done now the third preparatory work is identifying the piece which needs to be surveyed while the original survey has was undertaken the piece the abadi land which is called gautan or laldora in different play if different names and different states was not measured as a parcel it is the area left out of the survey so we have to survey the other lands to find out the boundary of this land these are the activities see what did we do in this project which is different from a any drone survey it might have been done in other places also but this is what we did it is nothing but pre pointing of properties which i will show in the image later on and most important thing is that as the process is about the claim and acceptance we told that the occupant themselves will pre point the property suppose if there is a dispute both will put the lines on the other side of each other which will be subject to inquiry there will be pre pointing of government properties also this is very important because if there is a survey with ets and other things there is no publicly visible marks that people can know and object to here your yeah, marking is there so other people can see and if they see that public road or public amenities are encroached by someone they can take an objection either formally or informally if they are worried they can take it informally also this is how it is done uh, to give an example you can see various marks sometime as l some sometime as t sometime as plus it depends on whether that point is joining three boundaries two boundaries or four boundaries 
this is the only manual improvement we have done in the drone technology that we are putting marking of occupation before the drone flies this is possible with the flying of drone because the drone will fly the next day we can do that in case of a satellite it is very difficult uh, as you might be knowing most of the satellite take 200 square kilometer and we have to mark it in that area and if the particular satellite comes and if the drone is not i mean if the uh, atmosphere is not very clear we lose that so this is a marking which is done this is the drone currently we are using we are using other drones also but the, this is a major drone currently we are using which is a hybrid drone with a vertical take off and landing facility this is done in the field then the rest of the work is done by survey of india or processing ortho rectification geo referencing image alignment stitching them together and the survey is done by connecting the dots you have only the points marked by lime powder sitting in the lab someone drags the mouse along that and the survey is done imagine how much time it would have taken for the person to go all the corners of the properties but now by dragging the mouse and connecting we get a geo referenced parcel with a decimals up to 6 decimals of square meter accuracy this is an exact thing this is a uh, actual thing which has been done and now we are ready to go to the next level the issue comes wherever as being an optical drone something which is below the trees has to be measured through traditional means either by ets or once the cars comes by gps and they again it has to be fitted into the map then all said and done we have to verify through ground truthing we select the places very randomly and we cross verify like we do ets measurement of certain properties and cross verify with the report which came from the uh, survey of india which is which has done the feature extraction and after confirmation we go to next level i want to uh, uh, you to look into this map which is showing the number survey numbers any traditional even modern survey method including ets and gps would have generated something similar to this like for example this 97 91 numbers would have come but even an educated person or experts like us would not have understood whether the 97 map encloses within itself the property which is on the left side which is not possible for any other methods but in this method we can see that any even uneducated person can see that within that the parcel which is marked his or her properties inside this is only possible in this technology because which is very uh, uh, based on optical so highest transparency possible people cannot complain that your surveyor has made a mistake two feet has gone my 2 feet of my constructed area is outside the map now this complaint is not possible so one it is preventing disputes two no one can distrust the survey this is seen by the people three no one can go and get a dispute after 30 years in a court we will produce only this image saying that this is what was there this is not imagined by someone so this is the biggest the transparency is the biggest advantage of this model we do enquiry we issue a preliminary notice we hold enquiry on objections we have given right of objection only to people who are having locus standi someone cannot say that other person is object uh, other person is encroaching on the third person the third person has to do that but if it is a public property anyone can object this is a model uh, we are doing and the decision on objection is taken by enquiry officer finally this is in different states as uh, alok sir told this different state there are different things this is what we grant as a sanad sanad is grant of land uh, we have made uh, special efforts that we are printing this as a uh, special secure paper from india security press so that this record is very very important for them it is uh, once in a lifetime for a property not for the person it is a once in a lifetime for the property hereafter there will be record of 
it changing to one person to another, but this is the only first time record that it has been granted without the any charges from the government. What are the advantages? It has been covered already. Less time, less efforts, less manpower. Most importantly, it is suitable for the job. We should know that out of a thousand hectare village, the area to be covered is only two to three hectares. If we include even the additional area, it will go up to seven hectares. Now imagine flying an aeroplane or imagine doing with a satellite. Uh, it's like uh, digging a mountain to catch a rat. So this is a, I mean, suitable for this uh, work and we get 3D images as well as contour maps. Uh, so tomorrow, if the Gram Panjait wants to have a drainage or water conservation, the proper contour is available. HP leveling, high precision leveling is part of this project uh, for Maharashtra. So we will get a 20 centimeter accuracy of vertical accuracy. Minimum 12 centimeter for the horizontal, 20 centimeter for vertical. And uh, most important thing is that it will prevent future disputes. Today, a survey is needed. Today, the mobile GPS can have an accuracy of only one meter or two meter. Uh, time is not far, maybe another five years down the line. The GPS chip in the mobile may have a 12 centimeter accuracy. Then people can just download our map and they themselves can measure whether he is having this land or not. The speciality of surveyor going and measuring and maybe leading into doubts and distrust may vanish in future. The, as I told you, what you see is what you get in drone survey. Like this, this is what we normally hear in other uh, information technology products. And in survey technology, this is it, this is the visibility. So it is creation of map as occupied unless it impinges on public rights. Creation of rights based on any valid proof of possession. In fact, there are a lot of questions whether this is going to pay, favor the powerful. No, this is going to favor everyone, whoever is in possession. Normally, the rich and powerful have the records and the poor, disadvantaged, do not have records. This survey goes with pure possession. It doesn't ask for any other proof except that whether they were living there for 30 years, Thanks to government of Maharashtra's recent order, anyone who is occupying prior to 2011, that is only nine years old, is going to be given the rights of the land. Right, and uh, for Gram Panchayat, accurate levy of taxes, updation of tax, tax register on the basis of whenever the record of rights is updated, there will be less problem about ownership Protect, protection of public properties. Uh, this is another issue as the, uh, uh, the country grows, population increases, more and more possibilities of vested interest taking over public properties if it is not measured. Now hereby we measure and we have a proper record if, with whether there is an encroachment on a road or not, we can uh, survey and tell. Earlier it was not possible. What are the issues? Like NREs, we have NRVs non-resident villagers. So people are not there. Who is going to tell what is their possession area? In some places we found those, play, those people are out of uh, the village for 40 years and they are saying that, sir, we own this land for uh, together, but we don't know which part belongs to us. You tell us. We told that, sir, you have to claim and you have to divide among yourselves. We will only confirm. The need for inquiry officers at one go, for example, uh, we have to give 10 million property rights. Now, we need so much of inquiry officers. This cannot be outsourced because this is a sovereign duty. I mean, uh, other things can be outsourced like drone flying, feature extraction, but dispute resolution has to be handled by our people. This is one of the issue. Areas with heavy tree cover like Konkan area, where uh, maybe we have to use the uh, LIDAR uh, drone, etc bringing systems uh, together and establishing integrated systems for future. These are other issues. Uh, this is all uh, from me. Uh, I close it here because uh, I'll be open for questions later on. Thank you. Thank you very much, Commissioner. Very um, interesting and I really appreciate the detail and getting to see these maps uh, directly, some nice examples. Um, and I think you raise a, um, Beyond showing the uh, the potential, I think you also 
call attention to some of the issues. Um, I certainly have um, experienced the the challenge of the maintenance of such a big cores network um, is non-trivial. Um, just the financial and the um, calibration and the continual um, maintenance of those um, operating stations. Um, I think you also point to the um, the part that um, certain disputes and things, no matter what we can see from observation and from aerial photography, certain elements have to be resolved uh, talking to people or coming on the ground uh, with more traditional survey. I think there's some interesting work happening now around fitting uh, radar and LIDAR onto drones uh, to be able to see through trees. I think a lot of that is still relatively young and um, tends to call for bigger drones, heavier cameras, uh, <laughs> stronger batteries. So in some ways there's a technological uh, uh, war to sort of try to each, uh, each new challenge requires a further technology. Um, thank you very much uh, for that and look forward to coming back a little more in comments. I would like to turn now to some uh, global experience and some global innovation. We have um, the um, privilege of having our two next panelists um, uh, from Ukraine. Um, and a place I was um, also fortunate to work with in development of the cadaster. Um, so I'd like to, uh, and they'll be uh, talking particularly about um, uh, use of high resolution satellite for a variety of land monitoring purposes. Um, so first, uh, Denis Bashlik, who is the former chair of State Geocadaster of Ukraine. Dennis, welcome. Thank you for joining us and over to you. Yeah, th thanks, Malcolm. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank for the invitation. It's a great honor for me to make a presentation on our experience of conducting, of implementing uh, remote sensing technologies in uh, governing of the state. So I will start right now. Here it is. Uh, so, uh, first of all, I'd like to tell a few words how it started. It was a World Bank project uh, which was called uh, Building uh, Evidence-Based Policy in Ukraine. And uh, I, will, I would like to tell you why it was called uh, in that, that way. Uh, just a second. Oh, here it is. Uh, here you can see how the uh, land ownership structure being changed uh, starting from 1990s. Uh, actually, uh, the statistical uh, information, the statistical data uh, stopped uh, to be collecting uh, at uh, 2016. Uh, so, the, so Ukraine had no any evidence-based information uh, about the land. Uh, uh, so uh, if we take information from the land cadaster, uh, by now it's only 73% of total area uh, are registered there. So uh, we had uh, uh, the information that uh, m m a lot of data is outdated uh, because it has been collected uh, uh, on the based on the methodology which is based on historical records which is not uh, always uh, uh, in, in date with reality uh, so if we talk about state service ukraine for geodesy cartography and cadaster uh, why 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 this uh, state authority needs uh, remote sensing uh, usage of remote sensing te technology. First, uh, we should ensure that, uh, that the central and local government authorities, individuals, and legal persons comply with uh, land legislation of Ukraine. Uh, state geocadaster is in charge of conducting land inspections. Second, uh, is providing uh, for implementation of the state policy of land use and late 
land protection. Uh, then we wanted to prevent violations of Ukrainian law on land use and land protection, revealing such violations and taking actions for their elimination. And the last one, but not the least, is ensure that land owners and land users comply with national standards in the area of land use, protection of land fertility, preventing land contamination, providing an environmental protection. Uh, if we talk about uh, new possibilities for the state, uh, which remote sensing technologies provide, first, it's transparent land monitoring, crop statistic on the state level, fair competition for uh, all the land uh, for all the agricultural sector, collapse of the of corruption, and sure, it's civilized, civilized land market. Uh, uh, I would like to tell you uh, on the, about the steps uh, which we've taken to, in order to roll out all the, this project on the whole territory of Ukraine. We started in 2016-2017 uh, by piloting methodology on two small little districts. Uh, we've developed and tested methodology uh, and uh, developed all the data requirements for further integration with official data with state land cadaster and so on. In 2018, uh, we've decided to uh, enlarge the project on three regions. And the last step was in 2019, it's national roll uh, out of the project. Uh, we've covered all the whole territory of Ukraine. It's about uh, 600,000 of square kilometers and integrated it with a cadastral map and uh, our inspections, land inspections. Uh, so, uh, if we talk about methodology, uh, we've used only three uh, satellite images from Sentinel-2. Um, but we've, uh, we, we, we decided that it's impossible to use only one uh, satellite images, so we needed to use uh, the time series of satellite data. As you can see on this uh, picture, uh, sometimes it's really uh, easy uh, to see, for example, uh, where is uh, wheat, but um, in two... Uh, uh, in two months, uh, in four months, it's really impossible to uh, identify uh, only using uh, a satellite image uh, which field uh, the crop on, on the field. Uh, as you can see on the uh, picture on the right side, uh, different green color, and it's really impossible uh, to identify what is it. So uh, we made the first conclusion, uh, conclusion that uh, we need to use the series, time series of satellite data. Second, uh, uh, in order to uh, make uh, the relevance of uh, data uh, much more high, we decided to use field uh, testing. Uh, for example, there we've, we've collected the data from the fields uh, during the whole country. Uh, trip, uh, we've took some samples in order to use it uh, on the next step. Uh, I will tell you how we use it. Here you can see uh, the methodology of using time series of satellite data plus uh, field, uh, field, field data. We've made uh, the big data complex uh, use artificial intelligence and uh, on the uh, as a, at the end, we've received a, a crop map, uh, which relevance was about 95%. And we still use it uh, right now. Uh, here you can see the road of collecting land data for summer crops in 2019. Uh, it's not really a big uh, trip. As you can see, it was necessary to take only uh, a little bit few oblasts, uh, regions, uh, data from the few regions in order to make uh, evidence-based uh, uh, samples uh, for the, our system. Uh, here you can see how it looks like. Uh, uh, this is a crop classification map of 2019. Uh, we have uh, summer and winter uh, crop maps. Uh, and uh, in, uh, I would like to tell you how we use this information uh, in our work, uh, especially in uh, land and uh, state uh, governance. 
First of all, uh, what we use for land inspections. Uh, we've uh, did, uh, found out how to uh, uh, see the uh, cultivation, cultivation of unregistered lands. Uh, we've downloaded, uploaded the information into a cadastral map uh, and compared it with uh, crops. Uh, and uh, we found a lot of uh, lands which is not registered in cadastre, uh, but they're being uh, used from year to year. Uh, it's about, for example, uh, here you can see the map of one uh, rayon. Uh, it is the smallest administrative uh, uh, region. Uh, and it's about 22, 18, 22% of total area is being uh, used illegally as fact. Um, here you can see uh, correspondence, correspondence to the designated use for our pilot rayons. Uh, for example, for agricultural lands, it's about only 7%. Uh, but for water fund and hayland, it's about 40%. Um, next slide. Uh, also, I would like to tell you some interesting cases uh, which we uh, found, uh, which we found from uh, with the help of this uh, geo portal of uh, crops. Uh, for example, military airport, uh, which is not used for the last, uh, for example, 10 years, uh, but it's been cultivated from year to year illegally uh, and uh, no one sure pays any taxes or something. Uh, and uh, we made the land inspection, uh, field inspection for, the, uh, for this uh, land and found out that really uh, from year to year by some uh, people, this airport uh, is being cultivated. Uh, then we can use it uh, for tax man monitoring. Uh, uh, here we've, took, uh, we've taken uh, one uh, agglomerated territory, uh, Gromada, we call it a region, uh, in order to understand uh, how many people, how many uh, hectares of land are, are not, not been uh, how, how many taxes is not paid, actually. Uh, so uh, actually it was, uh, according to official data, uh, only 3,700 hectares uh, uh, taxes being paid. Uh, but facts, in fact, uh, the land use, uh, according to satellite data, was 8,705 hectares of uh, agricultural land being used. So this is an instrument for evidence-based policy for controlling not only land use, but, uh, and tax monitoring. Uh, also, for example, uh, we've using it for monitoring of uh, illegal forest use. Uh, as you can see on the picture uh, on the left side, this is official forest uh, according to documents to our forest agency data. Uh, on the right side, you can see there are a lot of buildings uh, and it's really uh, hard to control and to monitor uh, if you don't have a uh, geo portal because uh, our old documents, forest documents uh, are in paper and it's uh, really hard to compare uh, it to a real situation because uh, it's a uh, it's a mechanism for actually it's a mechanism for corruption if you have uh, only paper documents you can see uh, you can say that well, well sorry it's not forest here uh, i will help you in some case uh, so the uh, geo portal uh, of satellite images of remote sensing uh, provides an opportunity to uh, to fight corruption in this uh, way uh, for example, here you can see also uh, the sunflower rotation, uh, how it's been uh, uh, how it's been in uh, periods from 2016 to 2018 in Mykolaiv region. Uh, for example, there is some cases when from year to year people uh, cultivate sunflower, which is uh, uh, actually prohibited prohibited in Ukraine. Uh, uh, next one is uh, cultivation of critical slopes. Uh, 
uh, we've used the uh, elevation model from uh, digital elevation model from Cadaster in order to compare it with uh, crop maps uh, to understand uh, which lands have been legally used uh, on critical slopes. We also found out a lot of uh, such cases. Here you can see on the picture on the left uh, the, the example. Uh, so, uh, uh, if you talk about state uh, land use inspections, uh, the uh, results of using remote sensing planning. Uh, uh, first of all, now we are using evidence-based planning because uh, uh, in past uh, the uh, inspection road was a little bit theoretical. Uh, they just uh, uh, planned some road uh, in, in, in according to old documents, to old statistic documents, uh, which is absolutely uh, not uh, it's 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 not relevant it, it they were absolutely not relevant now they use evidence based planning uh, the results uh, the effectiveness of inspection uh, has risen from 40% to 93% uh, budget use is about 30% of economy because uh, uh, there are no uh, let's say so empty inspections for example when they are going to some object which uh, is not uh, we, 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 which is not uh, identified on the satellite and they don't find any violation and uh, return uh, to their office. So, but the state already uh, used budget for, uh, for this trip. Uh, and local budget income uh, from fees and from taxes is plus 28% uh, for year. Uh, uh, so uh, this was a short overview of the pilot project on remote sensing uh, usage in Ukraine and using it for evidence-based policy in state regulation. Thank you. And I would like to give the floor to Denis Nizalov. Yes, thank you very much, um, Denis. And I think um, fantastic uh, to show how with so um, by combining different data products, uh, satellite time series, cadastre mapping, crop sampling, you can come up with such a powerful, uh, powerful tool. Um, also working in Ukraine, uh, Denis Nisalov, who's a senior governance advisor with Prindex, a professor at De Montfort University in Ukraine, and also the uh, former um, uh, director of the evidence-based policy project uh, for land markets in Ukraine, uh, Dennis. Thank you, Malcolm. Uh, thank you, Dennis. Um, so, and uh, thank you very much for this opportunity to present today. Uh, so I was pl privileged to work with uh, the World Bank and with uh, state uh, land cadaster in Ukraine for about six years. And uh, uh, I, I, I should, first of all, I should acknowledge that uh, Denis Bashlik represents uh, the cohort of uh, new reform or oriented government officials and without their support, it uh, was not possible to introduce several innovations that improved transparency of land governance in Ukraine and one of uh, such innovations was uh, presented today. Um, and. Uh, while well, Dennis has um, described uh, how the state cadaster is using uh, the remote sensing data uh, that comes from, uh, from uh, satellite imagery, uh, we used uh, Sentinel-1 and Sentinel-2 and Landsat-8 uh, for, for building the complete map uh, of land use in Ukraine. I would like to uh, briefly overview the other uses of this data that is now available to a wide range of stakeholders. Uh, and I will start with uh, the improvements in uh, state agricultural statistics, uh, because uh, historically the state statistics for uh, agriculture was based on self-reporting by agricultural producers. And what we were able to uh, actually reveal with uh, the satellite imagery is that we have a lot of discrepancies be between the reported uh, data and what was actually um, 
uh, growing uh, in the fields, uh, while the area of uh, cultivated land was approximately correct uh, in mesh with the uh, reporting by the company, but the uh, structure of crops uh, was uh, quite different with much higher share of uh, intensive crops such as sunflower, which was uh, regulated for the uh, soil protection reasons uh, by the state, but uh, companies effectively cultivate uh, sunflower uh, more frequently repeating the, uh, the, the cultivation in the same field, which was uh, illegal in Ukraine. But also we were able to uh, identify that Ukraine uh, companies started using more and more two crops uh, per year uh, in the same field, which was uh, never reflected in the official statistics. So Ukrainian agriculture effectively is more intensive than we uh, tend to think before based on the statistical data. Uh, and uh, yes, uh, so that, that, that's uh, one of the uh, use and application of the results of the remote sensing. Uh, the other purpose actually, actually of establishing this system of remote sensing is uh, to support uh, development of land market, uh, both uh, rental and sales market for agricultural and non-agricultural land. Uh, so by matching the uh, actual uh, land use uh, for several years for each plot, uh, the users, um, uh, the owners of land can actually um, establish better valuation practices and be better control practices for their private land uh, that is uh, either rented out or uh, which is brought uh, to, to the market. Particularly this, uh, this question becomes uh, relevant because Ukraine is opening up sales market for a large share of agricultural land starting next year. Uh, Dennis has mentioned already some examples of uh, illegal land use, and I would like to add to this list uh, the illegal mining of uh, natural resources, particularly amber, uh, which causes a lot of uh, damages um, and degradation to the land use in the areas where it is practiced. So that is yet another contribution both uh, for sustainable land use uh, and also to fight with uh, illegal and uh, even criminal practices in, in using the, the land resources by state. Um, I would just uh, like to ask Malcolm to signal when I have three minutes left so that I don't go over time. Uh, so the next important use of this data, and that's actually yeah, how- Five minutes left. In Thank you. Uh, so, and that's how actually this project came up to existence is the uh, use of the remote sensing data uh, for identifying the irrigated land and uh, to provide information uh, to feed into the sustainable use of water resources. So the first question which we actually had to face is how much land is irrigated in Ukraine, how much land is used from different sources and how to come up with the balance of water use. So that was uh, the actual start of this project. And I don't know if Dennis is aware about this starting point for this project, but that, that how the project has started. Um, all right, uh, we uh, we've, we've been approached by several uh, user groups for this information, uh, including the insurance companies that are interested to use uh, the data from the remote sensing on uh, agricultural land use uh, to uh, enable them assess uh, the damages and to monitor the use of the land that is uh, insured and uh, the land used by agricultural producers that buy insurance policies. Uh, the second group of users are the agricultural finance companies uh, that would like to use this data uh, to support uh, different instruments, particularly the promissory notes, and uh, to be able to use the remote sensing data to verify uh, the output level at, uh, uh, by the agricultural producers that use these instruments. Uh, finally, 
uh, the data allows, uh, the remote sensing data allows to make a significant improvement uh, in the quality of administrative data. Uh, Dennis has mentioned the example of the digital elevation model, uh, but that would be true for several other data sources that we use to overlay uh, with the remote sensing data. So for example, when we uh, went through the verification of uh, the results of this uh, uh, these pilots, we have inspected several places where a potential violation were detected and we have identified that the problem actually is with the quality and accuracy of the government administrative data in some cases, particularly with the digital elevation model. So the use of uh, this data uh, in conjunction with the targeted inspections uh, allows to improve a wide range of administrative data and by, by doing that to improve the quality of government services uh, that are provided in a transparent, uh, in, in a transparent transparent way. Uh, before closing, uh, I would like to uh, highlight that uh, using this large-scale uh, remote sensing operation uh, contributes to development of the multi-purpose cadaster in Ukraine uh, and open up opportunities uh, for a, a wide range of the users uh, to access and use this data and to uh, benefit from the economy of scale uh, in development of such infrastructure. Um, the, the, the use of this technology, however, has its uh, natural limits. Um, the previous presenters uh, made presentations about the use of precise um, imagery received from the drones. So uh, our example uh, comes from uh, the opposite range of the use of the, uh, of the remote sensing, where we use quite uh, coarse uh, imagery with the, uh, with the uh, size of the, uh, of the pixel 30 by 30 meters, uh, which came from the Sentinel-2. Um, uh, so, uh, uh, However, uh, the, 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 this, uh, this uh, uh, source, uh, source of imagery serves completely different purposes, uh, particularly because uh, we have to use time series of imageries. So we have to, uh, to collect and process uh, the, the complete set of imagery for the entire country several times per year. So, uh, however, we should recognize that if we are interested in, in cartography, in high pre uh, precision uh, imagery, uh, we need uh, to complement uh, with uh, uh, different other sources of, of data. And uh, also in terms of uh, temporal scales, there are also some limitations that are related to the frequency of data that becomes available from the sources that we have used. In some cases, it's not frequent enough, for example, uh, for uh, detection uh, of, uh, of harvesting, of, of particular illegal harvesting or some violations in uh, use of forestry resources. Um, so that just uh, highlights the need for, uh, uh, for using the complementarity, uh, uh, complementary data sources to improve the range and quality of the government services. So and there are several uh, directions for the future improvements in this technology. However, I would like to uh, highlight that the major step that Ukraine, uh, Ukraine government has made is to bring the use of the remote sensing data in the practice uh, of government and to improve transparency of inspectorate func functions and several other functions. And that took a lot of political will uh, to change the policies and procedures uh, to make the use of this data legal and supplement uh, the, the data with the, uh, the relevant uh, infrastructure to achieve the results that uh, was demonstrated by Dennis. And thank you very much. I will be happy to uh, answer your questions and provide additional examples. Thank you very much, Dennis. Um, and you really um, expanded our understanding of how these are, uh, this, this monitoring technology can be used and where it can go in the future. Um, so I think we've really had in this session actually two um, examples of really at the cutting edge of use of innovative technology in uh, cadastral mapping and in land monitoring. Um, the first um, with drones, I would say, um, particularly with the very high resolution and the application into residential um, areas, as we've seen, 
as well as agricultural areas. The second, uh, more uh, utilization of satellite imagery linked with a number of other data sources, including ground observation um, to provide a, a government with a very systematic monitoring tool for a number of functions. I am very aware that we are the last session and that we have now encroached onto the final remarks and the closing period, but I would really like to uh, have a opportunity for the participants to, uh, to make some questions um, if there are some, and we could um, perhaps see those people could come on or type in the Q and A. And while those are, while those are coming, let me just um, ask um, if to um, maybe, Shekhar, yes, why don't you go ahead? I was just going to say, uh, but you don't have to take this now. Uh, uh, Dennis Snizelov referred to the uh, very important political steps that had to be taken uh, in order for Ukraine to give credence to the satellite uh, data and to incorporate them in practice. And the question is, uh, in the Indian context, what would that mean? Uh, and it may not be a question for Dennis to answer, but for many others uh, in the panel here are uh, represented Alok, Dr. Krishna and others uh, who might want to reflect on both the central level as well as the state level uh, kind of political changes or acceptance that will have to, to really happen for even the Swamitva scheme to gain the credence and the kind of sustainability that it deserves. So that, that was a broad question, uh, but maybe we can come to it, you know, after some other more pointed questions. Thank you, Shekhar. Um, I am, I was going to actually ask a very similar question about, you know, really um, how to manage the, the, the functions here at different levels and of government. Um, but let's take uh, one here, uh, actually from Commissioner Chakalingam, the success rate of identifying crops, uh, especially mixed cropping, um, and some of the challenges um, as um, cultivation and cloudy weather tend to happen at the same time in India, that's the monsoon. And how is how have you managed to handle that? I think that's a question uh, to Dennis and Dennis. Malcolm, would, would you like me to start with question or should we take a couple of more questions and then we'll go through them? Why don't we take these uh, two that have been raised so far and I think they're, um, uh, why don't you start with the one about identifying crops and mixed cropping and uh, right. handling uh, weather? Right. Uh, so uh, the uh, the technology that we have used uh, allowed us to identify about ninety five percent of uh, of the surveyed uh, uh, of, of the surveyed land. So uh, most of the errors uh, that well, the plots that we were not able to identify uh, belong to uh, to the the, the, the uh, classes of the mixed mixed use. So that's that's exactly the the, the problematic area where the the imagery with high resolution is required. Uh, the examples would be the areas which uh, have uh, small plots. Uh, so we, uh, we the size the average size of plot is very different across Ukraine. In some areas, the size of the plots is relatively small. Uh, moreover, we have a difference between the size of the plot that is used for uh, own consumption and for uh, for um, uh, industrial production, right? And also, some plots used uh, several crops, uh, uh, either for intercropping uh, or because of uh, different types of contamination. So uh, when we went uh, to check the uh, the quality of the recognition and check what happens with the fields where we couldn't identify. So that was exactly uh, the reason. So most common uh, problem was that 
uh, the fields were contaminated with, with other crops. Uh, so uh, the, uh, the, the second problem, uh, we, uh, which is uh, related to the clouds, was not really a big problem because we used time series uh, of, uh, of images and we were able to uh, actually, in case of problems, to rely on uh, imagery that came from other date uh, when the uh, when the imagery was collected. Plus, uh, it is only Sentinel two that uh, uses the uh, the optical diapason. Uh, the other two uh, sources uh, didn't have this problem with with uh, optical visibility. So it was it was not really a big problem for for our particular uh, project. Uh, but uh, intercropping uh, contaminated crops that that's really the area where we could not uh, do much except of either identifying as the other use uh, or using the, the supplementary uh, imagery with higher resolution i guess uh, that's that's you. all what i can tell <laughs> thank you dennis um so let's go back to the other uh, panelists i think to um uh, particularly um, Alok and Commissioner Chakalingam about the um, the challenge of uh, potentially implementing something like this across uh, different levels of jurisdiction in India. Alok, yeah, I, got it. I like think to... yes. Let's come to you. Thank you. So I was. Uh, I am a forest officer, forester by training, and I was uh, by the denizens that they were being able to, uh, yeah, locate the encroachments inside forest. Uh, because here, from my current standpoint, I am the opposite. I am not uh, getting into controversy. I am not trying to evict people. Most of the time. Uh, the uh, at least the scheme itself. Of course, if some states have gone beyond the definition of abadi and chosen to give property cards, that is something that they've had to improvise and devise strategies for. But uh, the scheme is actually within the abadi area, so that way it is a very liberating thing. Uh, people have lived there for generations together. And they've not had any paper to show for it. You know, you go to these villages sometimes the conflicts stretch across generations. There is some confusion somewhere that my granddad or his friend in his presence, this land was given away to some such people to the extent of so much. And nobody has verified that, but based on some heresy or some confusion, these conflicts just eke out uh, across generations for years together. So I am in uh, uh, the happy situation of being welcomed by um, by everybody, which is why the politicians have taken it, uh, yeah, with open arms, and which is why we are under pressure to implement it in all sorts of places. Uh, and then, from the foresters' point of view, we try to do that actually. In fact, Choka Lingam is here; he would know uh, about the the Maharashtra example, where they had the implementation of the Forest Rights Act. So, inside forest areas. Uh, there was a cutoff date that was determined. Uh, so if you were a settler in that area, you were a other traditional forest dweller or a forest rights uh, person who have been there since such and such time, uh, then you were allowed to uh, get that land in your name. And these people in Maharashtra did a very good job of organizing uh, satellite-based data and from which they could clearly delineate uh, uh, pockets of land or uh, large pockets of land, uh, which were uh, then subsequently given away to these people. But uh, so far in the Swamitpa implementation, we've not had this issue here because the encroachment typically would be <coughs> of public land and public land uh, has been surveyed. It's wasteland or, uh, yeah, or some such, or Gothani as this, uh, Gothan as the, Chokalingam would tell you, but inside Abadi area, no big issues that people have not been able to solve themselves. So, uh, yeah, maybe Chokalingam want to share something from his experience in Maharashtra, but that is my position. 
Thank you very much. And uh, uh, Commissioner Chocolino, if you could also, we've got a, um, another question to you that I think is related about the ability of drones to capture plot level details in highly densely populated areas and areas with lots of vegetation. So we have both a, um, a kind of question about the, the, the degree that the technology can detect and then also this question of uh, the, the sort of usage and the different uh, jurisdictions roles in using these data. Yeah. <clears throat> Thank you. And uh, yeah, so I could, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, are you answering, sir? You can go ahead, sir. No, no, no. Uh, please carry on. Uh, sir, uh, the, the second one first, uh, which is uh, raised by uh, uh, Kapoor, uh, that is drone able to capture plot level details of densely populated and vegetation areas. Uh, the densely populated area is not an issue for drone. What might be an issue is the verticality. So far, uh, we have flown drones and uh, we were able to handle the issues up to, uh, say, two stories or three stories, three floors, I mean, from the ground. Uh, our experiment with higher heights uh, is uh, still on. We have selected one uh, municipal town in uh, uh, Aurangabad area for checking whether this is working or not. So densely populated, not much issues because everything is visible from the top. In fact, densely populated areas are mainly without surrounding land to the building. They are normally only the buildings and buildings alone. Surrounding area is also a building. So what happens is that the Chuna marking I have shown has become irrelevant. Our work has become less. Wherever the, uh, the villages which are close to towns are there, they are one building after another, one building after another. So we have to just to mar the building as an independent unit. Uh, there are issues about uh, the other side where one building is occupied by more than one person, which as of now, we are not handling. Uh, if it is a horizontally different people, then we put a chuna mark on the, I mean, lime powder mark on the top of the uh, building. We Then we uh, divide. So. Uh, to answer it shortly, uh, the dense population is not an issue. Verticality is an issue we are just trying. Vegetation, I have told you, optical cameras are not able to handle that. If they are thickly, the vegetation is covering the plot of the land, then we have to experiment with some other thing we are here to experiment. Uh, this is the one. And the second thing is that there are other issues which is, uh, uh, I mean, coming up in different states. For example, one issue came to us, which is a very purely legal concept. How do you handle the property owned by, which is typical to Indian situation, called Hindu undivided family? It is not owned by individuals. Hindu undivided family is a legal, a legal uh, person. It's an artificial person, but legal person. It owns the land on behalf of everyone. Individuals are not owners. Now, the Hindu undivided family was together maybe 200 years earlier. Now, there are the descendants are around 50 people. Are you going to put 50 people? Are you permitted to do that? Or you have to put the family alone? This is one issue which is coming up in areas where this family concept is very strong. Uh, some states are experimenting with, uh, un, uh, I mean, Abadi, uh, beyond Abadi areas. I mean, beyond the core unsurveyed areas. Abadi basically means inhabited area. But we are focusing in Maharashtra and one or two states, we are focus, focusing only on the unsurveyed land. Some states are trying with unsurveyed, uh, not only unsurveyed, but surveyed areas also. There the problem of matching existing records, existing maps, 100 years old, and the current uh, occupancy comes in. Certain states have a problem of not having surveyors. One or two states have abolished the... Uh, the field level machinery saying that surveyors are needed only once in 30 years whenever uh, they undertake the uh, uh, survey. The other one is as satellite map are also used to determine ownership of land. Uh, as far as my knowledge goes, uh, the accuracy, the best accuracy available is 30 centimeter. And if you are speaking about pixel accuracy, it is 2.5 multiplied by 2.5 and it goes to 75 centimeter. The accuracy is established 100 years earlier, 
is 25 cm for agriculture land and 12.5 cm for the uh, housing area. So the accuracies which are available today through satellite are not up to the standard which is expected for surveying, which was fixed some hundred years earlier. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Chakalingam. And I think, um, as you mentioned, with both the family land and then the issue of, re of reconciliation with existing records, that um, again, we see the, in spite of the great uh, efficiencies of the drone technology, there is still, this is not a silver bullet for resolving underlying questions of ownership, which still require um, even with much better spatial and updated special information, the person-to-person uh, -person and the uh, deep consultation with the existing record. And, the, um, and I noticed your, you flagged the availability of, of uh, human power in the administrative uh, authorities to resolve these questions is, is an important constraint um, regardless. I believe we are um, almost, uh, we've, we've actually exceeded time a long time ago and uh, Shekhar has graciously let us run over. I would, I think we try to bring to a close um, at this point. And I think, you know, for me, the session has been um, um, quite uh, excellent, quite positive in the sense of really showing how a technological advancement in both the drone mapping side and the satellite monitoring side is enabling um, efficiencies and enabling really at the people level, the enfranchisement of, of records down to village level at a scale and a cost that was heretofore not available. And these are also affording uh, through things like the monitoring we see in Ukraine, um, ability to uh, improve land monitoring and uh, governance functions uh, for greater efficiency and equity. I think what we also see, however, is that technology by itself is not a magic bullet. It has to be accompanied by all of the uh, systems uh, to in maintain the technology and to be able to uh, respond to the actual um, legal and uh, personal requirements which it brings out. I think we also now uh, collectively globally in this field are facing then many issues about how we manage and control these data. Who has access? Who can update? How is it uh, shared? Um, and how is it used over time as we accumulate more and more highly accurate spatial data. And I think that uh, could potentially be the topic of another, of another session as, as we go forward. So I'd like to uh, very much thank uh, each of the panelists, um, Alak Nagar uh, from the Joint Secretary at the Ministry of Panchayati Raj, uh, Commissioner Chakalingam, Settlement Commissioner of the Government of Maharashtra, uh, Dennis Bashlik, uh, former Chair of State Geocadaster of Ukraine, and Denis Nisalov, a senior government advisor at Prindex and professor at De Montfort University. Thank you all very much for the time uh, sharing today. And thank you, uh, Shekhar and NCAR for uh, hosting this session. And back to you, Shekhar. Uh, thank you, uh, Malcolm, for conducting this. We are uh, 15 minutes off target, uh, but that's reasonable given the richness of the discussion we've had. Um, should I just hand over to Dr. K.P. Krishnan or uh, Shom, would you like to take over in between or Shashank? So it might be either Shom or uh, Deepak has joined, I guess, if he would like. Oh, he has? Okay. Yeah. Pass it on. Deepak, why don't you take over? Thank you, Shekha. Um, I was really sitting back and listening for a long time and hoping I wouldn't have any responsibilities as such, but <laughs> it's been a long day for me. But uh, thank you very much. It's been a really uh, <clears throat> very uh, wonderful session, which has really pointed out to us how much can be achieved 
if you really want to do it. I mean, there there have been you know really signal examples of people who presented who actually achieved, and always brings me back to the Indian situation where how do you really get around to securing outputs when a lot of it is only about showing that something is being done. And on that note, I want to bring in KP for his concluding remarks at the end of this fascinating four days where we've had numerous examples of varied situations in land. And I really look forward to his abilities to stitch it all together. KP Krishnan, as most of you will know, is uh, a former colleague from the Indian Administrative Service, Karnataka Kada, who's held numerous wonderfully important positions in government, including additional secretary in the Department of Land Resources, which is closest to this workshop, and brings uh, to this uh, conclusion, this con uh, concluding session, a really rich and varied experience and very insightful ability to, to uh, point out to us dimensions and aspects which we may otherwise miss. So I eagerly look forward to his comments now. Thank you, KP, for agreeing to be with us for this concluding session. Thank you, Deepak. Uh, let me begin uh, by thanking Shekhar, Shashank, Professor Gupta, and Anika for this opportunity. Uh, as you rightly said, uh, India Land Forum 2020 has been I think a very productive and very rich conference. Uh, I had some uh, commitments over the last few days to some selection committee that I'm a member of in a regulatory agency. And some of the candidates uh, were not in India and these sessions spilled over beyond 5 p.m. But I still managed to attend many of the sessions over the last few days. I of course attended all of the sessions today uh, and, uh, you know, this afternoon, while I was uh, preparing my remarks for this concluding session, I was reminded uh, of what uh, one of our colleague uh, think tank uh, CEOs these days uh, and a former DG of RBI, Dr. Rakesh Mohan said, and uh, Sashank, uh, this will be of uh, great contemporary interest to you. You know, after one of the monetary policy uh, announcement uh, meetings, uh, Dr. Rakesh Mohan was doing the press briefing. And when a difficult press reporter uh, you know, repeatedly troubled him uh, on, you know, he insisted on a particular question, Dr. Rakesh Mohan famously remarked, uh, sort of addressed him and said, Mr. XYZ, let me make one thing very clear to you. I have come into this briefing room with a set of six or seven questions and with printed answers. You can ask me whatever you want. I'm going to read one of these seven answers. Now, you can ask me about golf, you can ask me about cricket, or you can ask me about Bollywood, but my answer is already printed here. So. Uh, since I have a lot of respect for Dr. Rakesh Mohan, I'm going to take a cue out of his book and perhaps say uh, things about land that were not necessarily said in this conference. And uh, But uh, on a more serious note, uh, sort of setting the context for land, land clearly is very important, very critical for Indian growth and development. And unlike the other factors of production, uh, and strangely, notwithstanding all that we read in our textbooks about, uh, at least in the initial years, capital being a constraint, today, the limiting factor is not capital. And certainly, maybe in some areas of skilled labor, labor could be a limiting factor, but uh, on balance, capital is not a limiting factor, labor is not a limiting factor. Given the immobility and the fixed nature of uh, land, perhaps the biggest factor constraint on Indian growth is likely to be land. And uh, you know, there's this interesting piece of statistic uh, statistics from one of the UN reports that I sort of very fond of quoting whenever we are in the context of land. 
India has always been land scarce relative to most countries uh, and compared with 1960, this data which looks at 2050 finds that India, uh, the land population ratio in India will decline fourfold. That's an enormously large number. And by 2050, the prediction is China will actually have per capita, land per capita, four times what India has. Brazil will have 20 times what India has. And it's only three countries actually which will have land per capita less than what India has. Bangladesh, Mauritius, and Netherlands. And remember, a growing and a prospering India will actually aggravate the problem. <coughs> Excuse me. The micro, uh, therefore, the micro stress on land uh, is something we need as a public policy institution thinking and working on land to bother about. But what is equally interesting is the somewhat different macro picture. And the macro picture is agriculture accounts for, I think, something like about the last numbers that I saw, about 42 to 45 percent of India's land, but only 14 percent of India's output. On the contrary, less than 5 percent of India's land is actually accounted for by both urban and industrial use, and I'll use these as proxy for uh, the secondary and the tertiary sector. These contribute close to 67% of India's GDP. And there was another uh, sort of interesting thought experiment that uh, we did when uh, we were uh, handling a parliamentary question in the Department of Land Resources. If <coughs> all of India physically were to be pushed into urban locations and everyone were to work only in industry and services, the land, the incremental land required for this is approximately 25 million hectares, which is under 20% of the land currently under agriculture. So at a macro level, and, and I'm deliberately sort of, uh, you know, these are uh, caricature type numbers, at a macro level, this issue appears to be handleable, but it will clearly require large scale shift in both land use and ownership. And at some level, it will increase the micro stress. And I think this is the dimension, the macro versus micro, reasonable comfort at the macro level, but enormous stress at the micro level that we need to handle as policymakers, as researchers. Now, in this sort of uh, background, let me briefly look back at the sessions uh, uh, that we had over the last four days. Clearly, I'm not going to uh, go back to the very competent uh, daily summaries that were done by other colleagues who uh, fully attended these uh, sessions. On day one, we looked at uh, land record modernization, very critical when it comes to ownership related discussions and hence very critically micro. We looked at uh, the Delhi High Court case study on litigation. We looked at improving cadaster based uh, land records and some of this topic, the cadaster based uh, <coughs> land records was also covered today. Uh, including the international dimensions of this. Day two, we looked at property valuation systems, property transfer and taxation relating to property transfer and the record of Indian states. And uh, <coughs> Shekhar alluded to this about the, the political economy complexity and uh, the sort of the role of the Indian states in the property uh, transfer taxation system was covered in land uh, in the sessions in land two. Land leasing <coughs> and agriculture was the sort of the other topic that we uh, covered uh, this day. 
they, they three looked at gender, land, uh, and uh, sort of women's rights issues. And a very important topic on which uh, Vinky, one of my co-authors in a set of two papers that we published in the EPW uh, was a discussant, which is land as collateral for access to credit. And uh, the other set of issues that we covered included urban poor and land related issues. I won't go into the issues that we covered uh, uh, today because all of us were present. Uh, but in terms of uh, the themes broadly, I want to go back and, and Shekhar may recall, uh, I think it was 2017 Nimrana when uh, uh, I was in a panel, uh, perhaps chairing a discussion on land issues where I had listed out broadly five themes that I, I felt were uh, the themes that researchers and policymakers in India should focus on. One was <coughs> this whole state versus markets question in land. This is clearly an area where the state has been the dominant player. Markets have not sort of played or have not been allowed to play the role that they could potentially play. So the state versus markets issue. And the second relevant issue, given the dominance of the state and even otherwise, was serious issues in state capacity. And particularly, and, and since a large part of this is in the domain of state governments in India, state capacity in departments that deal with land, land revenue, land revenue, uh, survey, registration departments. Three, the third theme, technology adoption. Fourth, legal and regulatory changes. Five, center versus state. Uh, this is a, an enormously complex question in terms of the distribution of powers in the uh, constitution. There are multiple entries in the constitution that deal with land. Plus, <coughs> there are a couple of schedules in the constitution which rewrite some of the entries in their applicability to the tribal areas, to the excluded areas. So these five sets of issues, state versus market, state capacity, technology adoption, legal regulatory changes, and center versus state in terms of distribution of legislative and executive powers were the five sets of themes that I had identified uh, and, and uh, sort of concluded in our Nimrana discussions in 2017. And I see that over the last four days, we've actually covered all of these issues, some in greater depth, some in lesser depth, but clearly we've covered all of these issues. And I, I see that uh, exactly like Dr. Rakesh Mohan would have said, my printed notes of 2017 uh, continue to be relevant. And I think what uh, the, uh, the forum really brought home was the fact that we brought together uh, a whole lot of researchers uh, from very different institutions, from the private sector, from academia together, and I think one question which continues to be a paradox, and, and I think Shekhar alluded to it uh, when he uh, spoke after the, uh, the second presentation today, despite its importance, this is not a topic that gets the attention it deserves, uh, whether it's inside governments, whether it's inside uh, think tanks, whether it's uh, in academia, Clearly, this is a topic I think which requires far greater attention. And I think for that reason alone, we need to thank uh, Shekhar and the entire land team in NCAER for bringing this center stage. It's not often that we get together researchers who are working on these topics. And as a fellow researcher, I find it very valuable to get together with people who are working on this topic. There are serious data gaps that we are all trying to battle. 
and there are serious gaps in literature, especially the Indian literature that we need to address collectively. And I think uh, that great purpose of bringing researchers working on common topics, common themes, and policymakers trying to address these issues together is a great purpose that this uh, forum served. Uh, let me once again thank uh, Deepak and, and all my colleagues in NCAER and all of you who participated in the paper presentations, in the discussions for uh, this uh, very productive, uh, very high quality event. I'll conclude here. Uh, thanks again, Shekhar, over to you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Krishnan, uh, for both reminding us that uh, there's a lot to be done here, but that we have made a good start. Uh, and uh, thank you for hearkening back to your 2017 Nimrana presentation. I remember it well. Clearly, it made an impression uh, because though we didn't explicitly refer to it, uh, if, uh, as you say, uh, we seem to have covered uh, all five topics in some level of uh, detail, some less, some more, then I feel very gratified that Shashank and DB and Deepak and Shom have uh, really uh, cooked up a, a, a event or brought together an event that uh, has touched on all the right uh, spots. And it gives me great pleasure, therefore, to, to say that uh, that this is this has been a good start. Uh, I can't say that uh, we will not improve on it uh, next year, uh, but I think as this becomes uh, a gathering place for the kind of people you referred to, KP, uh, we will have achieved uh, perhaps greater and greater attention now being paid to this, both in terms of uh, researchers, data gatherers, but also policy makers. And it's, it's very good to have a look with us and uh, Chokaling them also with us. Um, I uh, am actually going to hand it back to uh, uh, Shom and Deepak and, and Shashank. Uh, but just to say that uh, the videos of the four days will be available shortly. An email will be going out to you with the uh, links on YouTube for these. Uh, most of them are ready. Some are just being given final touches uh, so that uh, it, both uh, for your own reference, if you wish to uh, review elements of the four days that we've had, but also to share with your colleagues uh, more widely, those who could not make it to the India Land Forum, uh, we'd very much appreciate your sharing them with the larger group of people. And uh, to the extent that uh, this is part and parcel of the NCR Land Policy Initiative, and also a uh, activity as part of the larger property rights research consortium that we have formed with uh, our sister institutions CPR and IPFP uh, and uh, CSEP or CESP uh, and several others who are associated with this uh, effort. The idea very much is to build this community of scholars, evidence gatherers and uh, policy makers who are going to take land more and more seriously uh, as we proceed. So with that, uh, uh, Shashank, back to you. Yeah, um, so Shekhar, I guess uh, um, uh, it has been a great um, four days for all of us. And um, I, I would like to actually request uh, Deepak to, um, uh, Deepak and Professor Gupta, I guess, to have the last word. Yeah, uh, I think Professor Gupta has been such a quiet and supportive presence all through these four days. And I'm really looking forward to him uh, really uh, giving us some last minute thank yous to everybody for being with us through these four days. So uh, Professor Gupta, I hope you will give us a few minutes of your time. Thank you. Yeah. Hello, good evening to everyone. Uh, this has been a lovely four-day feast. I am sure all of us enjoyed it thoroughly and uh, would remember it for a very long time to come. Uh, Dr. Krishnan, you would remember uh, some five, seven years ago uh, when you were with the Department of Land Records, you had set up a 
a conversation of uh, some of the institutions in the India Habitat Center on the digitization thing. And eventually that succeeded and we were able to uh, set up uh, a research program under the Omedia network because the government of India was somewhat hesitant at that point of time, but you were able to kind of get us the Omedia network. Thank you very much for that. And I think you'd be a very happy person to see uh, that uh, your initiative has not gone waste. It has been the encouragement of uh, Dr. Shekhar, who uh, actually for a uh, uh, time before that had initiated conversations with uh, um, Peter Rabley, Omedia Network, to work on, uh, to enter into the area of land. Actually, the NCR has been active for some years under the overall guidance of uh, Dr. Bide, except for a short while that he was with the MIDS. And um, at that point of time, we worked extensively with the National Housing Bank, Holcim, DDA, Larsen, Tubro, and several other, and uh, produced some good work. And even uh, the Delhi administration had uh, accepted one of our reports on uh, land pooling to make it an act. So, so glad Shishank, you are here with us to guide us. And then along around that time, uh, we had this uh, Deepak uh, for our uh, project to help us, guide us with his deep knowledge in the revenue field. And he joined us uh, at that point of time in our first study. And then subsequently, he has been uh, guiding, uh, giving overall guidance to a number of people. And I'm very glad to say that the in in the uh, N NCR's land policy initiative has been able to create a pool of young researchers under the overall guidance of uh, Deepak and Shum and with the, uh, with, uh, the initial boost of uh, Pre Dr. Prerna Prabhakar who is currently away. Um, and, and I think the five papers that were presented at this conference were largely the result of the uh, guidance provided by both uh, Deepak and uh, Shum. So thank you very much. Uh, then, you know, I mean, uh, we have to thank uh, uh, other people also, but more importantly, uh, Omidia Network is, uh, is the one who has been giving us Funds and we would like to place on record a gratitude to Omedia Network for the funding. Shreya, Shilpa Kumar, Rupa Kurva, Peter Rabli, and Shamoli have all been very helpful to us in all our work as a kind of a backup whenever we have had problems. But all these fees would not have been possible, but for the excellent uh, uh, presenters of the papers, uh, the discussants, the chairpersons, uh, and everyone who really, you know, they were the backbone and the panelists. Look at the couple of panels that we have had. Absolutely. I mean, I started my career in 59 uh, as a young researcher and a faculty member at the Delhi University. And I don't think one had many occasions that in one go you have such such wonderful panels and discussions. So thank you all the panelists, thank you all the paper writers. But paper writers will have an opportunity to review and revise their papers once uh, once uh, this now that this conference is over. We'll write to them, and we hope to bring them out in the form of a book or two. Uh, We'll also like to uh, thank Dr. Manna, who is, uh, whom I have not named, but the, who is the uh, Director General of the NSSO, CSO, who has uh, really provided technical support to all our research. And thank you, Dr. Manna, even if you're not here, but our thanks.
we are also thankful to the government official uh, and also we are looking forward to alok's uh, you know uh, presentations uh, subsequent thing you know what happens now on the samvita scheme and whether we can really get some lessons for us to carry out a concurrent evaluation and uh, as and when we begin so uh, i would like to kind of uh, uh, say that all this feast wouldn't have been possible but unless we had some excellent chef uh, excellent cooks and uh, i think uh, anika led the team of uh, this uh, of the of the you know back stage i mean no 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 nothing is successful without the people who are at the back of this and uh, i would like to particularly uh, say that uh, um, uh, you know uh, anika rehman sukriti chakravarti ritvik kendra uh, sadhana uh, all of them uh, really work under the overall guidance of anika so anika thank you for the excellent feast that you provided i think we'll have now the appetite thank you thank, thank you, you professor yeah. gupta thank you very much and i'd like to thank everybody uh, i'm so pleased to see dr prerna prabhakar uh, has been in this session as many of us know dr prabhakar has been busy with another creation uh, her own uh, new child so she is on maternity leave but prerna thanks for joining and really this is the coming alive of a lot of your efforts in working with our junior researchers and so a big thanks to you as well i don't have more to say i think it's been a fantastic four days uh, i'm just so pleased that the team has put this together this really is going to i hope become a landmark in uh, land policy work and property rights work in india and i look forward very much to the support of all of you for uh, continuing sustaining and growing uh, this event and all the work that will eventually uh, come into this fold uh, and both inspire new work as well as uh, showcase work that's already going on with that let's bring this to a close uh, uh, we are all uh, in a strange world uh, these days uh, we hope that that will end soon uh, there is certainly a lot of uh, new hope around the horizon with vaccines coming on that hopefully we will all be able to access we are very privileged of course in the indian setting and more importantly that uh, millions of our brothers and sisters in this country will be able to access that vaccine as quickly as possible um, land is going to remain important and i commend all of you for the attention that you've given it and the cooperation that you've given to ncer Uh, and the entire land team they're all here on screen for you to see i want to thank everybody for joining i want particularly to thank uh, the leaders professor gupta and uh, shashank deepak shom uh, anika and everybody else who's been here again good evening good night stay safe and we look forward to remaining in touch all the best everybody bye bye